and he is there online with us. Very good. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, um, and, you know, we'd like to uh, welcome everyone to this panel. And let me say that, um, you know, as has been indicated, every crisis brings forth important lessons to be learned. And the current, you know, global pandemic has revealed just how much room and necessity is, there is for, for these lessons. And the question is, what have we learned and how will that prepare us down the road the next 5, 10, 15 years? What lessons are to be drawn for this pandemic, for any pandemic, for the other issues we face? And, you know, while uh, resilience is not a new concept, it needs to be rethought. So let me introduce now the, the members of, of our panel. Uh, on my right, Professor Joanna Bryson, Professor of Ethics at the Heritage School. Uh, her research focuses on the impact of technology on human cooperation and uh, artificial intelligence, information and communication technology governance. And from 2002 to 19, she was on the computer science faculty at the University of Bath. She's also been affiliated with the Department of Psychology at Harvard, the Department of Anthropology at, at University of Oxford, the School of Social Sciences at the University of Mannheim, and Princeton Center for Information Technology. And I think we could, we could go on, but very, um, very good background, and, and I'm sure we'll look forward to what she says, and also Dr. Stefan Hoimann, who um, is a member of the management board at the Stiftung Neue Verantwortung. Um, he's a political science by, scientist by training, and during the past years he's built uh, the Stiftung Neue Verantwortung into Germany's leading nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank, working at the intersection of technology and public policies. He's particularly interested in agile and collaborative methods of policy analysis, and he works, publishes, and speaks on a wide range of topics on German and international tech policy. He's also on the board of the Open Knowledge Foundation Germany. And um, so, so two very, very qualified and very good um, panelists here. And we want to um, start this with a, with a, a, a question which, which will ask for a short answer from both of our participants. Um, so what have you observed in the COVID-19 crisis pandemic that you know, how have people reacted to it? What steps have, have been taken? What does AI imply for this? How, what do you see? What lessons? Do you Joanna, let's start with you. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks. Uh, nice to be back in baden württemberg uh, And um, so I guess the main thing that we've all seen uh, with respect to technology and with respect to this particular uh, crisis, the crisis of, of the pandemic, is uh, this change in our understanding of freedom, um, the, 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 uh, the, the concerns, recognizing that we have to have an adjustable sense of when we can go out and what we can do. Um, ha the, all the countries trying to decide how much uh, to trust the information that we share in order to, to monitor things. So when I think about uh, what this particular crisis has told us, I think about um, uh, the security privacy trade-off, but it's not that simple. It's, it's much more about um, structuring your government such that you can handle a problem and communicate about the problem and then come back, you know, not just build back better, but, but re-expand immediately when the crisis is over, hopefully a little better then too, so you were doing good work during the crisis. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to echo what uh, Stormy said when she introduced us, that there are four crises going on here, and I don't think that we can ignore or should ignore one of the main things I've observed in the last two years was a successful German election. A lot of us were afraid, now that Europe is recognized for its regulatory capacity, about the amount of money that was going to come into this election. And so I don't believe there was much sign of uh, successful interference in this election, and that's something to be celebrated. So I'm also thinking very much about democratic resilience and, of course, about sustainability. Uh, the, the, the crisis is not to be forgotten in winter. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Dr. Hoiman, same question for you. 
Yeah, hello. Um, very happy to join this um, panel. Um, I think um, on a, on a, from a broader perspective, it has shown us how interconnected and vulnerable we are. Um, I mean, we, we have a currently a trend of, um, you know, a, a resurgent nationalism and people want to build up borders again. And uh, COVID-19 really showed this is the, how, how interconnected we are um, and that it's no country in the world can, can escape the consequences and that we need to work together globally to find um, solutions. Um, so that's, um, that's the first thing. And I would say from a German perspective, and especially from a maybe technology perspective, um, the lockdowns have been particularly you know, formative experiences. And I think um, they have shown us how dependent we, have, we are on digital technology in, in a moment of crisis like this. And um, we have seen in Germany particularly how, how far we are behind other countries in terms of universal coverage with high-speed internet, or an education system that does not only use digital tools, but I think only also poorly still prepares students for the digital transformation, and also a public sector that strug uh, struggles to digitize um, basic processes. And so I think um, this has been discussed a lot in kind of sort of policy circles and, and in the tech community, but we have had a broader public awakening around this. And, and now we have a new government and we will see if, if this um, awakening and public uh, pressure will actually um, be uh, translated into real progress, even though there are some real challenges ahead for us to, to address these issues. Okay, thank you. So a, a big issue for, for this panel is how can we make our societies more resilient? Our societies are very complex, both technically, sociologically. Um, how can this resilience be supported and advanced with digital technologies? Joanna. Oh, I thought that was going to Stefan, wasn't it? I could, I could, okay, yeah. I'll try. Yeah, we'll go. Um, well, because uh, he's obviously attended a little bit more than I have to the uh, infrastructure questions. Mm -hmm. Thinking at the meta level, I, I, the macroeconomic level, I actually think it's slightly terrifying how well we have done given how the, the incredible change that we saw in society and then we didn't see enormous drops in GDP. Mm -hmm. And that makes me wonder how GDP could be so disconnected from everyday lives of so many people. Mm -hmm. And I think this may be symptomatic of uh, inequality. Uh, so I, I think um, in a way we, can, we should and, and can celebrate the extent to which we were able to innovate despite all these, these problems. We were able to communicate in ways we can, including good solutions and spread them out. On the other hand, uh, I was speaking to some of my colleagues in the German government saying, well, at least now that you've had this experience, and this was like uh, almost a year ago, say, oh, at least now you've had this experience of, of dealing with a lockdown and everything, you're ready for the level of change we're going to have to deal with, with, with the sustainability crisis. And they all just paled. You know, they wanted to believe this was a one-off problem. Mm -hmm. But I, I really think that uh, the... That, like I said before, that what we need to be doing is, is creating all these capacities, but also defending against their abuse. And that the faster we can change, the easier, I mean, obviously Germany is one of the places you say, a, a government can come in that will take all the infrastructure and potentially use it for incredibly not what it was intended mm -hmm. for. Mm -hmm. And so we, we really need to be thinking both about being able to rapidly act and be resilient and yet not being so resilient, or at least having some kind of defenses, such that the, this, this uh, capacity to interact isn't abused. Okay, thank you. And Dr. Hoyman, for you, what, how can we use our digital technologies to make our society more resilient? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great theme for the conference and, and a great question and something I've thought about. And I think it's, it's not primarily a technological question from what I'm seeing. I think that... Um, Resilience at the moment um, is mostly about mindset and institutions. And because of what we have seen, we actually do have great technology and, and great technological capabilities at our fingertips in, in Germany, but we have not really been using them to their potential. And so what do I mean, um, we need a mindset to become more resilient. I think we, we still lack more curiosity and excitement about technological change and its possibilities. And... Um, 
with this excitement um, comes an embracing of learning and collaboration. And I think that's something that the German bureaucracy has been um, particularly um, struggling with um, because it's very hier hierarchically and top-down organized. And I think learning on collaborative um, organizations um, are much more much more open and, and also willing to take um, risks because you, you have to try out things because that's how you learn. And so you, I think our inability also to, to learn or to learn too slowly um, is linked to an unwillingness to take risks. And um, we focus on processes. We have a very legalistic culture rather than on outcomes. And so I think we have to, we have to get to a mindset where we are much more adaptable to changes and to challenges like COVID. After COVID, they will just be the next thing. And we are in the midst of a huge um, climate crisis that will um, require constant um, um, adaptation and trying out new ways and, and trying out new um, techno technical solutions and thinking how, you know, how they interact with society. There's no master plan for that, but um, therefore the mindset, the ability to adapt is really important. I think that's one reason why, why smaller countries have been more successful in shaping, I think, the digital transformation as well as in their responses to COVID because they often have this um, this mi mindset and the smaller countries are willing to, uh, to take more risks and try out things. And then we need to um, have the institutions um, that support that kind of mindset and um, that make help it uh, flourish. Um, institutions that um, need to invest in um, technical expertise and bring that together with um, sociological expertise and, and governing expertise, um, the breaking up of hierarchical silos, um, more accountability, but not legalistic accountability, but accountability about um, out outcomes and incentives uh, for public servants to, to take risks and learn new skills. I think that's the basis from which we can use technology to address um, social challenges, whether it's a, it's a health crisis like the COVID-19 pandemic or climate um, um, change, which is an, an ongoing crisis and uh, something that will occupy our societies for the next decades. Thank you, thank you. Now, uh, this is for you, uh, Professor Bryson. AI is not only celebrated for its inspirational potential, but it's also the subject of numerous geopolitical and regulatory and certainly ethical conflicts. So what role can AI really play in making our society more resilient and particularly with you know, increased polarization and other issues? What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, actually, that's great. I have a, I had a couple of comments about it that come right back to that question uh, based also on what Stefan just said. Um, First of all, uh, some people might be disappointed because we haven't really been talking about the robots very much. You know, there hasn't been a lot of uh, discussion about, well, we've got this new algorithm. Um, and I, I think it's because we are succeeding in making AI more pervasive. And so what, what the, the fundamentally what AI does is it makes us, well, there's two things. One is that it makes each of us faster, each of us better at doing our jobs. Um, which sometimes makes us more exchangeable, which comes into the future of work things, but we don't have time to talk about that too much right now. Um, I think it will come up later. Uh, but the, the other side of that is that, um, we, well, actually, I want, I, 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 you mentioned polarization. One of the crises that we're facing is this crisis of inequality and polarization, and these are correlated with each other. A lot of people think uh, polarization is correlated with like social media use or something, and it's not. It is correlated with, with inequality, but not in every country. Germany and China are two interesting exceptions. Mm -hmm. And so we actually, I'll, I'll give you a few uh, uh, research things that have come out of Herdy School in the last year. Um, this, the first one is published already, which came out in December of last year, that, uh, that we showed that, the, that at least in, in theory, one of the reasons you might not be, uh, that you might suffer uh, polarization when you have high inequality uh, sorry, when you, have high, yeah, when you have high inequality, is if there's people who are falling behind and getting near a precipice, then they can't take the risk of uh, working with someone they don't understand as well if that is higher risk, even if it has a higher expected payoff. So you just can't take the, lot, the risk of, uh, of um, a bankruptcy or a foreclosure or loss of custody of your children. So these kinds of things happen more often in contexts 
well, inequality doesn't necessarily cause that kind of uh, slippage, but it does if the elite are allowed to take all, enough assets that the rest of the people are falling down. Mm -hmm. And Germany and China had worked hard to keep the bottom going up. Um, and so that's part of the reason we hadn't seen that. Well, we, uh, so there's two results I wanted to mention that came out this year, which are not yet published, but uh, one's from uh, my colleague, uh, Luciana Cangolosi, and she has shown that, um, that uh, in fact, the best compliance with uh, COVID restrictions happened in countries with high trust in their own governments. And whether it was democratic or autocratic didn't matter. It was just trust that mattered. And coming back to, to the stuff I was just telling you about, we went and looked at the data because what I described before was a model. And we showed not only did we match up what we had predicted, but really when you have that economic precarity, the main effect is this loss of trust. So not taking care of people, leaving them without enough of a safety net. And I don't think you, you, we've escaped it so long, but we may not be able to escape it forever if the inequality does increase. It's you know, like the housing crisis. If someone can buy an entire block and put one family in it, then a lot of other families have to move away. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think we do have to address these, and that's why we keep coming back and talking about the governance issues. I, just, I know I've taken a long term, but I just want to say finally about agility. Agility is, again, a luxury that you have to have enough capacity to do that. So we shouldn't just destroy the, the traditional infrastructure in order to be agile. We need to have good, um, appropriately refactored kinds of infrastructure that allow us to rapidly, as I mentioned before, uh, increase and decrease our security concerns and things like that. But too many people think agility in government is just throwing away and saving money infrastructure, and that, that's not true. And I have a paper on that too. <laughs> Email me if you need help <laughs> finding it, I mean. Okay, and, and uh, Dr. Hoyman, for you, um, um, how do you see, um, what should the government be doing to both proactively and in advance of, of destabilizing events, both identify them and take the necessary steps? And how can AI help with that or what risks would itself, should, should, it, should AI itself, or should we view AI itself to bring to the situation? Yeah, um, I, it's interesting that we haven't talked that much about AI yet, because I think um, in some ways, at least from a German perspective, we are still working on the basics, um, and AI sort of comes on top of it. And I actually see the biggest potential use cases at the moment for AI really in the, in, in, in the research field um, where we have lots of um, problem, uh, problems where um, big data sets and machine learning can, can help us. And we see in the healthcare sector, like certain questions we ask, we can automate and, and simulate um, and um, much quicker um, develop medicines or proteins and things. So there's, uh, there's some truly um, amazing potential there for AI. In terms of um, Government, what is really interesting at this moment um, in Germany is that we are building data science capacities in our um, ministries and across government. You know, that's part of the data strategy that was adopted by the previous government, and I think the next government will, will take on and, and further develop. So we are, we are actually building the infrastructure for collecting more data and empirically better understanding. Um, how policy works and what effects it has. And I'm very excited about that um, potential. And I think um, AI can play a role in terms of um, you know, one method of analysis to see um, um, how policy works. What we've seen in the pandemic though, and that, that is the part that makes me a little bit skeptic or pessimistic is that um, we haven't really embraced that, that mindset yet. And it's truly, um, frustrating um, often to see that, you know, how poor the quality of data still is we have on, on the pandemic, on where actually are the highest risks of getting infected. And I feel that's really still that we haven't really the, the basics in place um, in our um, public sector in terms of understanding the potential and then building up the infrastructure to, to have a good picture of what's going on and take much more Measured, measured approaches and targeted approaches rather than having a national lockdown. And so I think there's, there's a lot of potential for us, um, but um, uh, in Germany we still have a way to go 
in terms of putting the basics in place to collect um, the data and put that into perspective to way, evaluate policy. And I think um, AI as a tool can play a role there if we are successful in, in building up these sort of data competencies um, across government. Okay. Uh, one element that, that you know, is critical for societies to be able to react quickly is that, that they have processes in place to both understand popular opinion to, to react to it, and the de democratic institutions we have are extremely important, but also potentially exposed to AI and can be influenced, on the other hand, by the AI that the government itself can have. How do you see that playing into the whole resilience issue? Yeah, no, I, I sort of alluded to that in my opening mm -hmm. uh, conversation. I think one of the biggest concerns has been Although I have to say, uh, to slightly correct you, mm -hmm. it's never artificial intelligence that does this. The digital, it's the digital re revolution and we use artificial intelligence, but the, somebody is, the, whole, the A in artificial intelligence is artifact. So let's talk about who are the actors that might be, for mm -hmm. example, choosing to, or not choosing to assault the German election or the American election or a Russian election, right? Who, who are the actors that, that would be motivated to do that? One of the really exciting things about the digital revolution is actually we've empowered everyone, and the same with the transportation uh, uh, mm -hmm. revolution. And that means that the great thing is that we have all this talent that's online that we can communicate with. The scary thing is that now we have massive amounts of migration, and anyone can kind of come in and have these kinds of influence. So uh, coming, coming back to the, the question about uh, democracy, again, what we have to do, and one of the things people talk about uh, artificial intelligence, uh, the capacities, for example, of China, and, um, and say, oh, look, there's this huge thing. It's another model. It seems to be working. And yet nobody wants to go there. Nobody wants to move there. So, so far, we have done better. Uh, the, people like to come to the EU. They like to go to America. We, we need to work, of course, economically to make people want to move all over so we can have exchanges and not have you know, too, too, much, too many people paying for too much stuff. But we also, uh, uh, yeah, we, we have to realize that we can identify, so this is what you can do with social media. You identify the types of people who are influenceable and you, you, identify, you make predictions about elections, say where they're the close elections. And then you go and you try to influence them, maybe in person. It doesn't have to be hacking through social media, but you may actually go and set up rallies in the areas. It's about where you expend resources. And, and again, if you, have, uh, if you have too much stuff exposed in the digital media, we know the 2016 election, both political parties were hacked. The election itself wasn't hacked. But it could be that they, mis they misallocated resources. For example, uh, Clinton's decision never to go to Wisconsin she was sure that she had the numbers that her data science told her that Wisconsin was a sure thing. Why was she sure of that? So these are the kinds of, uh, uh, there's so many different uh, places that you can assault. And so I think one of the most interesting things, and I will say this, one of the questions we were asked before is what have we seen transnationally? The panels that I've been sitting on, there's a lot of dispute about should the EU be sort of recognized for, for what it's doing itself? Does it, it, does it have its own regulatory regime? And is it a third kind of thing besides China and America? Or is it essential that the US and China, I'm not China, <laughs> the US and the EU uh, somehow merge and, 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 and combine their regulatory uh, strategies? And it, it, especially the West Coast of the United States, of course, thinks that should just look exactly like the West Coast of the United States. Um, so not, even though they complain at the same time about their lack of capacity to legislate. Um, I think it's important that we should be empowering a lot of regions the way the EU has empowered itself, that when you have 400 million people, mm -hmm. that's about the right amount. It, it makes it worthwhile for transnational companies to take you seriously. And so I, in my opinion, uh, it is important. Of course, when we have good solutions, we should, we should share them. And I'd like to see the EU, since we are so affluent, taking some of the resources that we have to invent, innovate legislation and, uh, and passing that out so we don't just say these are our rules and you have to use them, but we say these are our rules that work in these contexts and we have different rules even by nation. Here are other regions of the world who do not have as much legislative capacity. Here's like an entire suite of rules that you can use. Um, and that's supposedly what the Global Partnership for AI, which Germany is one of the uh, founding partners of, 
uh, is the kind of thing it's supposed to be doing. It's coming up with uh, regulatory measures, but not, re not normative recommendations, so, so that we can just, but being able to describe what are the options that governments that want to be like us might want to absorb so that they can more easily cooperate with us. Mm -hmm. But again, striking that balance, I think we, we, part of the reason Europe has proved resilient is because of the strengths of the nations within it, that we found a way to both have strength as nations and to be harmonized and, and, and to, to use the economic. So I think it's a really interesting model, which is why I'm here. You can tell from my accent, I chose to come here twice. I took an EU passport in the UK. <laughs> and I'm very happy the new government says I might be able to get one uh, pretty soon in Germany too. So uh, who knows? Good. <laughs> um, so, you know, there are going to be a number of you, you both have seen the, um, you know, the agenda for the, for the remainder of the two days. Um, so let's start with you, Dr. Hoyman. What, uh, looking at the rest of the conference and, and the additional topics that are coming up, what observations or uh, comments do you have about, about those general topics? Yeah, what I would like to just um, make uh, one comment to what Joanna just said and, and the AI discussion. Mm -hmm. um, something that often gets overlooked is actually that the that the prevalence and use of AI um, sits at the heart of our question around democracy because um, it's uh, the social media and the big tech platforms that have been pioneering AI. And a lot of our online discourses, if they have, as they have moved online, are now shaped by um, machine learning recommender systems. And um, so one of, I think that AI is actually sitting at the heart of the question around democracy. Um, because um, how important AI is to how a TikTok or Facebook or Google works. Um, so I would just leave that as a, as a comment. Um, and um, regarding um, the conference, I mean, it's a, it's a very diverse um, um, program, um, really exciting. And um, what, I've, what I've seen, and I think what is also a theme here is that, and, and you've already mentioned it, is that a lot of people frame the discussion around AI as, the growing, as a growing conflict between the United States and China as sort of the AI superpower, superpowers that are competing sort of for, for technological dominance and the question how, how, you, how Europe fits into that or reacts to this. And I think what gets overlooked in this discussion is how internationally connected we are also in this AI space. Um, the research community is very international. The collaboration is international. Um, a lot of the technology is very open. It's open source uh, technology that can be widely used. And uh, so um, we should uh, not leave sight um, of the interconnectedness. And I think you, know, you saw the, the ability of countries to pressure each other in the global supply chains is a result of that interconnectedness. Mm -hmm. But there's also I think, um, hope or um, something positive in that, because it is also a factor that continues to force us to talk to each other and to find um, global solutions. And I think that's an, an important theme, not just to talk about the conflicts and, 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 and the driving force to, to nationalize technologies, but actually how internationally interconnected we are and how much we have benefited from cross-border collaboration, especially in the field of AI. Thank you. Uh, Professor Bryson, same question. Oh, well, I, I have to totally agree. I, at the same time, I remember uh, my, my, my uh, master's students at Heritage School uh, saying, oh, but now countries matter again. You know, the countries are back. We thought they were nothing, you know, and countries will always matter for certain kinds of coordination because we have geographic problems, so there will always, always be nations. And at the same time, absolutely, what we're creating is something closer and closer to like Kant's perpetual peace, right? The, the level of interdependence. Although we also know we need redundancy. We don't want to have only one airplane company. We don't want to have only one GPS. Mm -hmm. We do need to, to do that for resilient supply chains. So going into the question, I mean, I, first of all, apologies. I'm going to be in and out a little more than I should be. I really apologize. Uh, for that. Uh, um, but anyway, I will be here most of the next two days, but not all. Um, but I'm very much uh, particularly interested in the cybersecurity and the trade uh, questions, um, and, and especially this, this issue about 
some things really are national, natural monopolies and not in the old economic sense of, oh, it gets cheaper to make more episodes. It's more like everyone in the world could go and use the best one, so where, why would they go somewhere else? And if that's true, how do we uh, handle, how do we govern those things transnationally? We need to mm -hmm. both get the revenue appropriately redistributed, which this 15% tax is just the beginning of, and why does that exclude, incidentally, finance and consultancies? I don't understand that. Um, but, the set, but the second, and this is you know, transnationalism in general, not only AI, but secondly, I, I still feel like we haven't adequately interrogated uh, and clarified how you can choose to exclude the president of an elected democracy from uh, social media. Now, it had a massive, we can measure and say there was a massive positive impact in the, in the reduction and spread of disinformation when that action was taken. So I do believe it's justifiable, but I do not believe it's been adequately justified. I think we need more clarity about when it's okay, because otherwise we, you know, everybody will just say, hey, I don't think there should be a, an opposing opposition party or whatever. So we really need to have more clarity about these kinds of uh, uh, actions. But anyway, I look forward to, there's so many panels here, I really look forward to almost all of them. <laughs> all right, uh, thank you, I think that's all. Um, we're out of time, right? Okay. One more minute. Oh, okay. okay. Good. So a, a critical issue on the on the issue of of sustainability and really resilience is: Do we plan for the best of times? Do we plan for the worst of times? Do you want things that will survive? Um, you know, or or things that maximize the current situation? What do you think about that, <laughs> Professor Bryson? Uh, well, I think that uh, the definition of uh, regulation actually is uh, trying to persist into the future. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think we are, it, th that's just sort of what life does. And it's the, it's the foundation of our ethics. You said I was a professor of ethics. I'm really a professor of ethics and technology, but I'll briefly sound <laughs> like a professor of ethics. I don't know another strong basis for ethics except to try to, you know, to, to perpetuate and, and, and optimize. But the question is what? What are we perpetuating out of all the things we are? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's really... Yeah, I, I, maybe I, we only have a minute, so maybe I'll just stop it very esoteric there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. Then uh, we'll bring this to a close. Um, right. Good, thank you. Thanks. Thank Thanks you very much so. to our panelists. Yeah.